Well, like Brandon was saying, so this is the well weekend, and I think at some point it's an understatement to say what an amazing group that we do have up here. I'm, I'm privileged to be a part of the, of the well, and it truly is a, a pretty great group of, of solid people that are just coming together to grow deeper in their faith. And Brandon probably wouldn't want me to be gloating on him, but he's a pretty great leader, just saying. He's pretty awesome. So... Yeah, so some of you might know me. Some of you might think, like, who are you? And that's okay. I want to introduce myself real quick. My name is Tyler. Um, and I just want to share with you real quick about a passion that I do have and, and one that I am so excited to boast on what God is doing in. Um, so I am privileged to be a part of an organization called Youth for Christ. And what we essentially do is we reach lost and unchurched kids everywhere, right where they're at. And I believe in this mission so much that it is my day and my day out life. I'm always with a student. I'm always with a middle schooler or a high schooler. The, the furthest out kid, the one that has nothing to do with Jesus or doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. Those are my favorite people in the entire world. I love these kids. I really do. Um, because I believe in God's sovereignty. And I believe that God has a plan for each and every one of them. Every time I look at them in the eye, I know you are a chosen child. You just don't know it yet. Because I believe that God is sovereign in all things. Just as we're going to talk today about God's sovereignty, it's, it's important to remember that he meets us right where we're at. And though oftentimes we don't pursue him, he never ceases to pursue us. God is good, y'all. Last week, we talked about God's goodness and I think it's important to remember that God's goodness is simply that. God is good because he says he is good. God is good because he is good, not because we deem him to be good. See, we can't measure God's goodness on our scale because our scale is flawed. Our scale is broken. We are a fallen creation. It doesn't take much to see that. Everything in our lives has fallen. It's what we call the Adamic curse ever since Adam and Eve. And so when we rate God's goodness, we don't say it is because we want it to be. We say it is because he has said so. He has decreed it that way. That is who he is. And so when we say God is sovereign, we don't say he's sovereign because we think he is. It's because he says he is. It's because that is who he is. He is the I am. See, God's goodness and God's sovereignty go right together, and they cannot be separated. God is sovereign because he's good, and he's good because he is sovereign. So what does it mean to actually be sovereign? We discussed goodness last week. We're going to discuss sovereignty this week. What does that actually mean? Well, sovereignty is essentially the supreme power and authority, the top dog, the greatest of all. He is the beginning. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He's the author and the provider, Jehovah, Jireh. God is supreme. He lacks nothing. He is a self-governing state. And I think so often it's difficult for us to accept that because we lack everything. See, here's the thing. God does not need us. God does not need anything. He is complete in who he is. And when we look at ourselves, we know we have a hole in our life that we can't simply fill. Only God can fill that. So there's a disconnect in how we can perceive a perfect and holy God when we can't see anything past who we are, which is imperfect. But God bridges that divide, and we know that. We know that God does not need us. He doesn't need us to share his gospel he doesn't technically need us to save anybody. Jesus does the saving. The Holy Spirit does the saving. It's difficult for me day in and day out when I'm meeting with a student who doesn't know Jesus or doesn't care to know Jesus. I want to just step in and go, hey, this is Jesus. Like, trust me, I needed him. You need him. But that's taking on a savior complex. That's saying that I am supreme and I am sovereign and I can save you. I can't do anything in my own strength. I'm fallen just as they are as we all are. For the scripture says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Only he is sovereign. Only he could save. The Holy Spirit convicts our hearts. That's his job, not ours. 
And as we let that go, all the more we begin to trust in him and grow in him. God does not need us to judge. He doesn't need us to judge right from wrong. He doesn't need us to judge what should have happened in our life or what shouldn't have happened in our life. Why did this come up? Why didn't this come up? Why are there difficulties in my family? Why are there difficulties in my life? Why is that person not listening to me when they should? I'm only trying to help them. Our job isn't to judge. Our job is merely to point to Jesus. He is the judge. God is the creator. He is the beginning and the end. And here's, here's the thing. God doesn't need us for his glory. We know that we were created to give him glory. We were created to love God and to be loved by God. That's obvious. But does he need us to give him glory? If we weren't here, would God fall short of his glory? No. Because God is glorified by his own creation itself, by who he is himself. Scripture says, even if we are silent, the rocks will cry out. The mountains will declare his praise. The animals will rejoice in his coming. And the oceans will roar his greatness. See, to me, that, that speaks wonders. Because here's the thing. I've seen the glory of God in, in creation. For those of us that are other believers, we see God's work all around us. I know for me, I, I'm a surfer. Obviously, I, I live... Look like so I live in St. Augustine. Um, so I was out last week, and I was out with a few of our, our students, and um, it was an evening session, which means the you know, sun was going down. It was just a beautiful sunset. So, so nice. And I remember looking out, and I was just kind of admiring God's creation, just kind of sitting there waiting for the next wave to come. And I remember thinking, God truly is who he says he is. Only he could create something this perfect. Only he could create something this beautiful. That there's no doubt in my mind that he is sovereign. There's no doubt in my mind that he's the creator. I think so many times when, especially whenever we're musically talented or maybe we're cooking or drawing or whatever, artists, I guess you'd say, you, you kind of look at your own creation and you always go, oh, could have been better. You know, that could have been different. It's really bad over there. So, so we kind of judge like, oh, it's not, it's just not perfect. But have you ever looked at creation, just, just looked out at the stars or just looked out over the ocean and just said, it's not good enough? No, because God is good enough. He is perfect. His creation is perfect. So as I sat there just looking at it, I'm just like, you truly are. There is no denying it. Then I caught that wave. Um, <laughs> well, I actually missed it. Uh, but God does not need us to declare that. He allows us to, and that's humbling, and that's a privilege, but he doesn't need us to. He is incomplete of nothing. But we are complete in him. And so we see that in creation. We probably see that in our own lives. But we also know that he is sovereign because his word says so. We can test it in the scriptures and we can know that this is true. Here's the thing about scripture. A lot of times we say that it's a guide to life or it's a map to success. Or I hear all the time people outside the church say, oh, it's just a book of rules. Well, you know, in some ways it is. It is those things. But I think that falls short of what scripture really is. And we'll realize that scripture is God's word. It is him. It defines him. It characterizes him. It reminds us who he really is, his sovereignty and his goodness. See, when we realize who God is, we have no choice but to fall short of who we are in him. It takes us out of the picture and it highlights him as the pinnacle importance as he needs to be. When we realize who he is, we see whose we really are. And then everything falls into place. So as we read scripture, we know it can be trusted because he says it can. I want you guys, if you would, please stand with me for the reading of scripture. We're gonna jump into Romans and we're gonna see what Paul here says about God's sovereignty. 
So in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 33, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has given him anything that he may be repaid? So for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory. Y'all can take a seat. If this doesn't remind us that he truly is sovereign, then maybe we need to check our hearts. Because here's the thing, when we look at scripture, we see that it's not only true back then, but it's true today. When I was in, when I was in seminary, um, one of the things that we learned to do is dissect scripture. And we have this big fancy word, we call it an exegesis, which is like basically the bringing out of scripture, the diving deeper into it to see why it is what it is and how it says what it is and how can it be trusted. And one of the things that you do in an exegetical study is you cross-reference the text. So that basically means you say, what is it saying now and what did it say before? How do we take the Old Testament and compare it to the New Testament? How do we say what's being said now compared to what did they say earlier and does it really hold up? How do we validate that? See here, Paul is already doing it for us. Paul is referring to the prophet Isaiah. Paul is reminding the church in Rome here that God's plan of salvation is sovereign. He's reminding them what Israel was reminded by Isaiah. Isaiah had a pretty difficult job. He had to tell very stubborn people not to keep doing what they do. Pretty sure all the parents said amen because they know this feeling. So when we jump to Isaiah real quick, I want to read what, what he was telling here. So it says this in verse 12 of chapter 40. Who has measured with his palm the waters or marked off the heavens with a span, held in his fingers the dust of the earth, weighed the mountains in scale and the heights in balance, and who has directed the spirit of the Lord or who has instructed him as his counselor? Whom did he consult to gain knowledge? Who taught him the path of judgment and who showed him the way of understanding? God reminds us that my ways are higher than your ways as my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Who could ever tell God this shouldn't have happened or this should have happened? Who can judge what he deems right or what he deems wrong? God delivers us in his will, not our own. Who is his counselor? Who is the one that hung the stars in the sky? Who is the one that told the mountains, you will be this high and the oceans, you will stop here and go no further? Wasn't me. Only a perfect God can do that. And so Isaiah is reminding the people of Israel, you have turned away from him, turned back to him. Remember his persistence and his covenant for you because his plan for you is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is sovereign. We use this word called a unilateral covenant in theology, and it basically means that it is one way. God's sovereign plan is one way. We can't change it. We can't alter it. He meets us where we're at because he is perfect, because he has deemed that it's good. If you haven't read the Old Testament much, I'll give you a spoiler. It's basically God's people. It's Israel constantly turning away from God and then being back to God and then doing what they want and then going back. And God's constantly saying, come on, like slapping you on the head. Come on, what are you doing? But every time he does it, he does it in grace and judgment righteous judgment that is good because he's deemed it to be so because they deserve the wrath that comes upon them but so often he spares them of it not because of who they are but because of who he is because he has a higher purpose to bring them back for himself he has chosen them and so Paul as he quotes this text he's trying to tell the church in Rome God has a plan that he's chosen us See, Paul is describing to the church in Rome two things, sanctification and justification, how to be saved. Simply put, the church didn't deem 
certain people good enough or worthy to be saved. They didn't deem that it was in God's will for them. Who are we to judge? See, they thought only the Christians, the Jews at the time should be saved. Those that are outside the church, they don't count. And what Paul is saying here is who could question the Lord? It says, for in him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory. All things. That means all people. That means he calls all of us. He denies none of us. He pursues us. He meets us where we're at. So it doesn't matter whether we're in the church or out of the church. God loves you. He is calling you to be a part of his family because he has deemed you worthy. Not because he needs you. I think so often we look at what's going on in our lives and we say, you know, God, I can give you this much right now, but it's really difficult. So I can't give you this much that you deserve. And how easy could it have been to say, man, y'all really deserve this much, but I have given you this much in my son. So often we look, why did these things happen to me? I've been burned by the church. I've been burned by my family. I've been burned by these situations, whatever it is. And God, this hurts. But you know what? To be able to take that in the middle of it and say, God, I know these things hurt, but they are of such little importance compared to you. And more than I want these answers, more than I want anything that I want for myself, I want you, God. I want you more than I want answers, more than I want my selfish ways, because my selfish ways are not good. I know yours are. Your ways are good. They are higher than my ways. And so as we remind ourselves to be humbled, that he could bless us still with grace that we don't deserve, but that we desperately need, it once again puts him at the pinnacle of salvation. Paul reminds us here that it is grace that we've been saved and that he has chosen us to be his people because he has deemed us worthy, not because we deserve it. And that's so humbling. It says in Romans, we're gonna backtrack one chapter here in verse 28 of Romans, I'm sorry, two chapters, but it's, uh, 11. It says, so, we know that in all things, they work for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. God knew you since the beginning of the world, the foundation of the world. As you were in your mother's womb, he knit you together. He has called us. I love when it talks in verse 29, it says he foreknew you and he predestined you. He elected you to be his child because he has deemed it in his will, not ours. That is so humbling that the God of the universe doesn't need me, but he wants me. He pursues me so radically that he would take death on a cross for me and bear my sins for me. See, I didn't necessarily understand that for the longest time. When I was younger, I struggled a lot with the Lord and I always grew up in a Christian home. I, I was always taught in biblical ways, but that really didn't mean anything. I didn't accept this sovereign plan for God in my life. I knew he was there and I believed in him, but the thought that he was still working through my life and pursuing my life just didn't connect. When I looked at me and my judgment, all I saw was distance and failure. Was that if there's so much of a perfect God out there, how could he make me like this? How could I struggle with the things that I struggle with? How can I never measure up? I'm not good enough. And so my self-image was terrible. It was flawed. I struggled a lot when I was in middle school and that's why I love middle schoolers so much. That's why I love lost people so much is because I'm like, I'm right there with you. It's by grace I've been saved, believe me. 
I struggle with a lot of self-image, identity, doubt, fear, anxiety, isolation, depression, a lot of self-harm, three different attempts of suicide. Because what I saw didn't measure up to what I thought God thought of me. I didn't realize that he had chosen me. And here's the thing. When it finally clicked, when he called me, and he opened my eyes to see that I foreknew you and I created you and I chose you to be mine, everything changed. Because it wasn't in my measure of who I was, it was in his. It wasn't in my life, but it was in the life that he redeemed me to have. Every one of us has a story. God has a story. And the coolest part is when his story gets to intersect with our story, not because we deserve it, but because he chooses it that way. Because he refuses to let the one go. See, God's story is perfect. God's story is one of salvation. When we study this in theology, we call it the Deuteronomic canon, which is essentially scripture. It's the beginning and the end, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, to come, what is to happen. He is sovereign in all things, past, present, and future. I don't know what you're going through, but I guarantee you, despite what changes may come in your life, he's still the same. He's still pursuing you. He still loves you, regardless of where you're at, because it's his love to give. It's just ours to accept. We look at creation, we know that it's fallen, and we know that we've screwed things up. We know that. We can see that with Adam and Eve. We can see that since then, nothing has been perfect. But you know what the coolest part is? Even when we mess things up, just a few verses later, Scripture already talks about the redemption of humanity. God already says, hey, I've got a plan for this. My plan is sovereign. It doesn't change just because you couldn't make it. I don't change because you can't make it. I make you worthy. Scripture says that he will strike your head and you will crush his heel. That's talking about Jesus, y'all. That's thousands of years before Jesus even comes and God's already saying, my plan goes beyond yours. It's gonna happen. I'm gonna redeem you. I'm sending my son to save you. He will take your sins, not because he has to, but because I want to. Because I love you enough that I will accept that on your behalf. When Jesus was in the garden, he was anxious and he was nervous because he knew of God's sovereign plan that was to come for him. He knew what was gonna come down. And yet in that, he said, not my ways, but your ways. He said, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it happen. But more than that, more than I want my thing, I want yours to be done. God, let your will be done. God knew that his plan was perfect. Jesus knew that the plan was perfect, but he knew that there were gonna be struggles and pain throughout it. Our lives are not perfect, but we serve a God that is. And as he redeems us and he sanctifies us, there's gonna be some pain. And my question to you is what does that look like in your life to trust him through it, to know that he is still sovereign, to know that he is still in control? See, I thought the more and more that I pushed God away, the more he would forget about me. But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter how far we run, it's only the closer he'll become. We can't stop God's love for us. God's love is good. His love is sovereign, not because of we think it should be that way, but because he has called it to be that way, because he proves it day in and day out. Through all things, he works for the good of those who love him. I couldn't stop his love for me as hard as I tried. And finally, when I fell before myself and realized I have nothing without you, suddenly I gained everything through him. And God's glorified for that, not me. 
I want to read with you one more verse. To me, it means so much because it reminds me that even in the darkest time, his love is perfect. His love is sovereign. It says, I am convinced that neither death or life, neither angels or demons, present things, future things, or any powers, heights or depths, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from God's love. His love is made perfect in our weakness. His love is proven on the cross. What he did there is finished. It cannot be undone. And it meets us right where we're at. That is the grace and the beauty of the gospel. That is the sovereignty of God's story. That it comes full circle. It's never broken like we are. And it makes us whole. I don't know what walls you might be putting up against the Lord right now or struggles you might be going through, but I will encourage you this. God is sovereign in his pursuit of you and he is desiring a relationship with you. And if you don't know what that is to have a relationship with Jesus, I wanna invite you to look into that. I wanna invite you to pray over that. It might be something totally different you've never done before. But I promise you, when we meet God on our knees, he meets us in our hearts because he's good. He's our father, whether we want him to be or not. And we're so humbled to be chosen as his children. God's love is perfect and it is for us. So who can be against us? If you feel that the Lord is pushing on you today, that you feel that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of something, or maybe you wanna have some questions about the church, or maybe you wanna talk about baptism or inviting Jesus as your savior, I invite you to talk with us today about that. Please, whatever you do, don't go home today with at least not considering what his word says because we know that his word never turns back void. So as we close in prayer, I'm gonna stand here and a few others from the church and I'm gonna invite you guys, if anyone has any questions or concerns or whatever, allow us to maybe meet with you. It would be a privilege to do so. Dear Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being perfect in every way. We thank you for your grace that you give that is sufficient for us, though it is not what we deserve. God, the more that we seek you, the more that you pursue us. The more that we deny you, the more you pursue us. You pursue us regardless because you love us, because your love is perfect. So Lord, if there's anyone in this room here today that does not know you, Father, I just pray that you would push in on them in your timing and in your will. God, I pray that you'll help us realize your creation. Open our eyes, open our hearts in a new way that we could not compare, one that we cannot do on our own. You are the savior and we need you. Father, I ask that you will do what only you can do. God, would you do a miracle? In your precious and holy name, amen.